Bruce McConnell here with Locomotive Systems Training. Hope you had a great week. And uh, here we are still with the FRA Locomotive Inspection. A lot to it. So let's, take, let's go on without any further ado. FRA Locomotive Inspection. Again, that's Federal Railroad Administration, which is a government agency. Uh, part one continued. We're almost done. I know I've been saying that for a couple of weeks now, but we are almost done. All right, this is SLSTV-023. And let's go ahead on to the next one. All right, remember, this whole inspection that we're doing, I decided to cover that because everything below the running board, well, not everything, but for, for an average locomotive, we're trying to get, uh, inspect all the components from below the running board down. Remember, those are the things that are super critical to make sure that they're right. The wheels, the brakes, the trucks, the fuel tank, couplers, draft gear, which we haven't got to yet, and those kind of items. So all very critical to the safe operation of that locomotive out in the main line or even uh, non-main line. All right, so we're still on the trucks. Brake cylinder cutout cock. Let's take a look at it. It says here, the purpose of the brake cylinder cutout cock is to isolate the truck brakes from the air brake system when performing maintenance, such as brake shoe change out or other maintenance work requiring isolation of the truck brakes. Uh, other maintenance items could be maybe had a defective brake head on the, uh, on the swing and the brake beam. Uh, where the uh, brake shoe got worn in to the brake head and now the brake head itself is bad. Any, any of those items you want to make sure that that air to that brake cylinder is isolated so that in the unlikely event that somewhere in the, somebody in the cabin or was air on the locomotive decided to or inherently move the automatic or the independent brake valve handle into the application zone, you wouldn't wind up losing your hand because that's an awful lot of pressure down there when that brake shoe goes up against that wheel. Alright, it's a safety item. Now, you'll, you may not be able to tell too well by the picture, but this is a locking brake cylinder cutout cock. And the reason why it's a locking cutout cock is because there's a lot of vibration. Remember, this is right, here's the truck, or the locomotive frame right here, and, there's a, and the truck is right down in this area here, and there's a lot of roadbed oscillations going through switches and curves and back and forth and up and down that we need to make sure that this, when we put it cut in, it stays cut in. There's no way that that vibration can take that handle and move it to the outer closed position because that would be catastrophic if it did because what we would do there, if that didn't have that locking cutout cock, then if that valve moves shut, then we actually cut off, minimize or cut off the airflow to that brake cylinder and effectively wouldn't have any brakes on that truck. So really, really important that we have this type of cutout cock. All right. This is the FRA rule 229.45, the defects. Again, once again, and you're gonna, like I told you, we're gonna hear, we've heard this a lot. Loose or missing fasteners, loose or damaged or missing handle and or handle nut. Remember, like I said before, a lot of vibration, a lot of things going on in this locomotive, okay? We wanna make sure that the uh, locking mechanism works properly. Weak, broken, or missing spring. Again, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 roadbed dirt. A lot of dirt, uh, if there gets oil or grease, I remember oil and grease with FRA is a no-no. I'll say too, if that spring gets weak or broken, then that handle lock or that cutout cock lock is actually defective, which will allow that handle to move to the closed position. So these kind of go hand in hand, the missing handle and or handle nut, weak or broken or missing spring. That's all in the locking mechanism. And you want to make sure that that, that lock is working properly. Uh, the handle does not work, stuck in the open position, or stuck in the closed position for that matter. The handle has to be, once you, put, once you depress that handle lock, you have to be open and close that to make sure that it moves freely. Okay. Uh, elbow is loose, missing or facing downward. Uh, remember we talked about this is a vented cutout cock. We want to make sure that when we cut that truck out, or that, uh, that brake cylinder cutout cock out, that that air from the brake cylinder down this is not blowing in your face. Remember, you always want it pointing down or facing in. If it's facing out or up, working, or you can feel that air. When you cut that out, that becomes a defect. So you want to make sure that that's not that way. Air leaks. Again, we need every ounce of air that, that air brake system can provide us for brake cylinder air. So if we have a leaking union here or this valve itself leaks or anything else, that takes away from our effective braking of that locomotive. So we want, if we have any air leaks, that's a bad thing and we would want to write those up. Uh, handle does not rotate freely. Again, if it takes a great deal of force to move it, either open it or close it, again, that's a defect. The handle should move very nice and very freely. Okay? Uh, brake cylinder cutout cock. All right, now, 
we're going to a whole different area here, and we're going to talk about the draft gear pocket. Okay, um, a little information on what a draft gear is and what a draft gear does. And when I think of the term draft, I go way back into the 1800s when most of America was farming communities, ag agrarian, or I, I really butcher that word pretty good. Anyway, they use horses to pull all their farm implements, hence the term draft horse. And I always think of a, like a plow uh, where a horse is pulling it. So draft means pull, okay? So that's hence the term draft gear. Um, but this, we're going to talk about the draft gear in a second, but what I'm going to talk about right now is this great big superstructure that's actually welded in two big areas. One is to the bottom side of the locomotive frame here, and the other one is located, you can't see it all, right here to the front wind sheet. Okay? Uh, this area, or this component here, the draft gear pocket, is subjected to virtually all the stresses and strains of that freight train. Okay, whether it be push, which is the term for buff, uh, or draft, which is another term for pull, buff, and then pull, uh, this draft gear pocket absorbs all that and sends all that forces up into the locomotive frame. So this, this draft gear pocket, this component, is made really robust or really stout because it is absorbing all the clang bang, and that's a technical term, that goes on with this uh, locomotive coupled either to another locomotive or coupled to box cars and going down the track okay so the purpose of the draft gear pocket is to absorb very powerful push buff and pull draft forces from both the locomotive and box cars through the action of the draft gear these are the rules that apply to it and let's take a look at the defects number one loose or missing fasteners now there's not an awful lot of fasteners here but they have this, this little great well not little it's a great big about a one inch thick uh, and it's really 12, 14 inches wide, depending on the type of draft gear. It has what they call a draft gear carrier iron that goes from this side of the draft gear pocket clear over to the other side that you can't see. There's four great big, I believe they're inch and a quarter bolts, but don't quote me on that. But they're really large bolts. Sometimes, believe it or not, those bolts will actually become loose. Okay? So once again, loose or missing fasteners, there you go. So you always want to smack those with a hammer to make sure they're tight. Okay? Uh, cracked wells, again, you want to look and make sure that every weld on here is intact and in good quality shape. If you see cracks in this weld anywhere, you write those up because a, a small crack up here can, can, can grow very, very rapidly with uh, just a little bit of, uh, of uh, forces in the, in the uh, train or locomotive. Any physical damage, again, um, usually when we have physical damage in the draft gear, that's a result of a really hard couple. Um, you know, or and we'll make it even worse if this locomotive was involved in a derailment or heaven forbid uh, was involved uh, clanging into cars, you know, I think they say like no more than four miles an hour but you know, if you had a 10, 15 or 70 mile an hour impact uh, you would certainly find that, of course if you're hitting a 70 mile an hour you're going to have more than a draft gear problem, you're going to have a whole bunch more problems. Anyway, you want to look for any physical damage, you want to look to make sure that these plates because they're all flat plates, you all want to make sure that there, there's no bulging. Uh, you'll also want to make sure, and there's wear plates inside the draft gear pocket, and also on this uh, cup, the draft gear carrier iron, you want to make sure that those welds in those areas aren't cracked or broken, or that the wear plates have actually worked their way out and they're gone. Okay? So look for any bulging back in here, along the sides here. You want to make sure that, that there is no... Uh, nothing more than, than flat, perfect, straight uh, material because if you see bulges, that's a bad sign that there's been damage there. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that's a draft gear pocket. So let's go to the next one. Now let's talk about the draft gear. Now you can't see it real well, but right inside this superstructure of this pocket is a little item called a draft gear. Okay. And let's see what the draft gear does. The purpose of the draft gear is to absorb the buff or push and draft pull forces that are created during coupling and uncoupling of locomotives and cars during train operation. And these are the rules, FRA rules, that apply to the draft gear. Okay? Number one, loose or missing fasteners, which we just talked about on the draft gear pocket and also the draft gear carrier iron. Okay? Um, worn, cracked, or missing draft gear wear plates, which we just mentioned a moment ago. Draft gear rubber worn, oil soaked, ripped, or torn. Now, all these draft gears are made of 
Some are made in what, what I would call a chevron or a wedge-shaped uh, draft gear. That's the design of it. Uh, the other type of what we call a laminate, or, or it's layered between rubber and steel and rubber, steel, rubber, steel. So those are your two basic types of draft gear uh, for your locomotives. But if I have, if the rubber is worn, uh, if it's oil soaked, ripped, or torn, then you would want to write that up for, for change out. The draft gear yoke rubbing on the draft gear carrier iron. This collared area, you can't see it very well, but right in here is what they call the yoke, and the draft gear sits inside that. Well, that yoke is what actually absorbs uh, all the, um, the, the, the draft and the buff forces on that locomotive. Okay, so what'll happen is as the rubber disintegrates, you'll start to get internal looseness between the yoke and the draft gear of the yoke, the yoke here, and the draft gear itself. And when they with the, when you get internal looseness, that's when the yoke, which is this outer part here, will have a tendency to drop down. And when it does, it'll drop down and it'll start wearing on, or laying on the uh, draft gear carry iron, and that becomes a defect. Um, worn, cracked, or missing draft gear bushings. Uh, there are some rather stout bushings that are in there, and what will happen is after clang bang and clang bang at a whole bunch of times they start to wear, and sometimes these draft gear bushings will actually drop down on top of what they call the pin retainer. That becomes a defect. The draft gear bushings is an inter uh, interference fit in the draft gear, uh, actually in the draft gear yoke, and if the, if the bottom draft gear, and the one that's in the bottom one, if the bottom draft gear bushing dro drops down on the keeper, the pin keeper, then that becomes a defect. Uh, again, what you mentioned, internal looseness between the draft gear and the yoke exceeding one quarter of an inch. Okay, and we can shim that up to a maximum of a quarter inch. Uh, coupler pin retainer key worn. That's a cast iron piece of metal that where the coupler pin is, and the coupler pins are anywhere from about three and a half, four inches in diameter, down to about two and a half, two and a half, three inches. And there's a little metal cast iron keeper that's in the bottom that fits through the through down here through the bottom to prevent that pin from falling out, okay? So when that pin gets worn pretty bad, then that becomes a defect and you wanna change it out. Free slack in the coupler and our drawbar not absorbed by friction devices or draft gears that exceed one half inch. So remember earlier we talked about the internal looseness between the yoke and the draft gear itself and the pocket, okay? The maximum slack we can have between the bushings, the coupler pin, the draft gear yoke, and also the draft gear itself can only be, cannot exceed one half inch. Anything more than that, now you're changing out coupler pins, you're changing out couplers, or you're going to you're going to shim up the draft gear or pocket or yoke up to a maximum of a quarter inch. But anyway, <clears throat> all those different clearances combined cannot exceed one half inch. If all those clearances, let's say you, you did what they call swing and slack, where you measure the, the free slack and all the and all these components, and if it exceeded half inch then you're doing what I just said a minute ago. You're looking at the coupler pin, coupler bushings, draft gear itself, and so forth, okay? okay. All right, next we're gonna talk about the coupler. The coupler is located on the outside area of the windsheet. You can see the windsheet here. You can see the windsheet there, okay? Uh, it's a rather large, and again, I always use the term robust because that means it's stout, it's beefy. And it has to be that because this guy here takes the punishment of the buff and draft forces on that locomotive, okay, the coupler. It connects uh, locomotives with one another, it, it connects uh, couple, uh, locomotives and cars together, so it's a rather stout piece of equipment. So as the purpose of the coupler is to physically connect locomotives and freight cars together to create a train. These are our rules. Now let's talk about the defects. Damage or missing knuckle pin cotter key. Right down here, you, you can't see it because this, we actually need to see it down below here. There is a, a rather large cotter key. That key has to be in there uh, because what will happen, the weirdest thing is, is as this, local, as this coupler is going down the track back and forth and acting all on all these forces, what will happen is that pin will actually have, for some reason, will actually want to defy gravity and actually work its way up. And the purpose of that cotter pin is to uh, keep that pin from staying in the downward position, okay? So it needs to be in there and, and working properly. Uh, the knuckle pin is broken. Well, remember just a second ago I mentioned about defects with that cotter key. Well, what will happen is, and these, for some reason, they break a lot. They shear off. Again, tremendous amount of forces. So when you're busy looking at the top of this coupler, you'll look and you'll say, oh, okay, there's my knuckle pin. Everything's rosy. Except the only problem is you 
put your hand underneath the bottom where this knuckle is right here and you reach up and there's a hole there and then you go hey wait a minute and being very careful that that knuckle doesn't fall out or land on your foot because that would not be good you carefully remove that knuckle pin and uh, try and lift it up a little bit and you know usually the from the top of the knuckle right here they need to break about that far down and it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen so two-thirds of that knuckle pin dropped and fell out somewhere along the track somewhere and all you have retaining that knuckle to that coupler is about that much of that knuckle pin again safety first you make sure that your feet are nowhere or your body is nowhere near that so if you pull that pin up that knuckle is not going to fall out and land on your foot or hit your leg or whatever remember safety first uh, let's see <clears throat> the knuckle the knuckle is worn past the wear limit now couple components to uh, talk about here this area right in here this rather large area and there's a good shot of it right here this is what we call the guard arm the coupler guard arm okay and what will happen is the guard arm it helps if I have an open knuckle on the locomotive or car that I'm going to couple into what it does it acts like a guide and will literally take that knuckle and have it fall along this edge and it'll actually become self-closing and it'll lock into place with this this is called the guard arm. A lot of wear occurs in there, so we want to make sure that when we get to a certain limit, that that's as far as it goes. And if it goes past that limit, then we need to then we need to change some components out to take that clearance up. Okay, so the knuckle is worn past the wear limit. Uh, this is the guard arm. This is the knuckle. Now, remember, I got a lot of wear on the pulling face of the knuckle again, due to the tremendous forces of that draft. Remember the pull, and as, not only is it being pulled, this locomotive, because of the up and down forces of the track and whatnot, the, 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 the knuckles don't just normally stay in one position. They literally follow a vertical path, and they'll begin to wear knuckle upon knuckle in there. So as this coupler wears, the material in this area becomes less and less, okay? Which also affects not only the, 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 the knuckle wear limit, but also the clearance between the knuckle and the guard arm, which we're going to talk about here in just a minute, too. All right, uh, so the knuckle is worn past the wear limit. The knuckle to guard arm clearance exceeds the wear limit. Well, <laughs> there it is. I just mentioned that. And the way you would check that is you would pull that with, with this, with the uh, top lock lift all the way down. You close the knuckle, you'd pull the knuckle forward, to take out any clearance or slack in there because there will be and then you measure the distance between the very edge of this knuckle here and the guard arm okay let's go on a little bit further uh the Coupler, coupler you're a little bit too far out too far out okay right there. right there uh let's see the coupler guard okay uh the coupler is cracked at the top or bottom knuckle pin boss or other areas right in this area here and right in this area here which is this area inside here and on the bottom is what we call the knuckle pin boss okay now, <clears throat> a lot of people, they'll look and they'll say, oh my goodness, it's cracked in there and in there. Well, there's a little terminology in, in the world of railroading. It's called a hot tear. A hot tear is where we actually have a separation of the cast iron as the metal cools. Okay? A lot of times a crack or a hot tear will be confused as, or mis misinterpreted as a crack. And it'll either be in the, here or in here, the bottom of the uh, knuckle pin boss or the top knuckle pin boss. What we look for is if, if, as long as it's a hot tear, but when, how do you tell the difference? Well, if that hot tear were to migrate, in other words, actually start to move, and we, there's a radius here in the top, and there's a radius on the bottom of this knuckle pin boss. If that hot tear actually starts to move or migrate or become longer in length, and it actually makes that radius bend either at the top or the bottom, then that becomes a crack, and that's a federal defect. Okay? But a hot tear in here in and of itself is not cause for uh, a defect. Uh, let's see. The knuckle does not open properly or does not open at all. Okay. We'll talk about this here in just a minute. Uh, we have a knuckle. Inside the coupler body, we have what they call a stop block. You can barely see the edge of it there. And this is a lifting bale right here, which is operated by a cutting lever or, or an operating lever. Okay. When you move that cutting lever or uncoupling lever, as the FRA calls it, okay, within a couple of short, quick pulls, that knuckle should open all the way up, all the way up and out of the way. 
there's a device in there that, that interacts with the stop block. It's called the knuckle thrower. But sometimes, due to wear in here, what will happen is you will take that cutting lever or uncoupling lever and you'll move it and it'll, it'll just stop solid. If that's the case, that's a defect because the knuckle or the coupler, the knuckle won't open up. Or if you open it, you keep open operating the cutting lever and the knuckle either moves barely or not at all, again, that becomes a defect. So, the component you look at there is going to be wear the knuckle, wear in the knuckle thrower, and also wear in the stop block. Okay? So, uh, and, if, and if you change all those three items out and you still, still won't work, you're changing out a coupler. Okay? Uh, let's see. Um, coupler exceeds the maximum coupler pin bushing to drive your bushing clearance, which is what we just mentioned on the previous slide. One half inch of one half inch limit of free slack movement. Uh, coupler height not within the limits, and there it is, 31 and a half to 34 and a half, and that's measured at the center line of the knuckle. Okay. Remember we talked about how the coupler actually goes up and down as it goes over switches and through crossings and whatnot. Okay. So there is a minimum there's a minimum lower clearance and a maximum upper clearance. The minimum was 31 and a half. So anything below 31 and a half is a defect. Anything higher than 34 and a half is a defect. We want 31 and a half to 34 and a half as measured from the center of the knuckle. Uh, let's see. Um, the cl coupler clevis with less than half inch clearance from the top of the coupler lifting bail to the clevis. Okay. This always seems to be a, a, a Need a little area of discussion amongst the railroad, railroaders is because what does that clevis do, okay? And as I mentioned, as we're going, that locomotive is going, again, over crossings or through switches and over frogs and this and that, what will happen is the coupler will literally move up and down, sometimes quite abrupt and quite a bit, okay? And what will happen is there's a slot, there's an oval, which you'll see here in just a minute, that this bale rides into. The FRA looks for a minimum of one half inch clearance between the top of this bale and the bottom, the, the, the bottom portion of that top area of that loop, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Okay, the, actually, the lower, the lower this bale is in this in, in this clevis, the better off it is, which might allow that coupler to move without any unintentional uh, uncoupling of that of that uh, knuckle. Okay, uh, coupler that does not have anti-creep protection. Now, clevis clearance is not an anti-creep protection. Inside, inside this area back in here is a little bitty device called the anti-creep protection. Um, and there's, a way to there's a way to check that. But I want to show you something first. You'll notice here that the very front of this lock lift assembly, I've got rusty metal right here, and you can see it even better here in other words, this clevis here, in this position, appears to be raised up a little bit, and that wouldn't be a good thing. That should be all the way down to that. But let's take another look. Let's go to the next one and see, see if we can see the difference, or maybe, maybe that's just the way where that one sits. But let's take a look. Before we go any further, we've got to talk about the coupler carrier iron. The coupler carrier iron, the purpose of that is to support the weight of the coupler as well as a tremendous vertical movement of the coupler during heavy draft, pull, or buff push cycles, and also allows horizontal movement of the coupler based on train dynamics. The coupler carrier iron is a renewable wear surface. So as the coupler goes back and forth, back and forth, it's going to wear, there's a wear plate on the bottom of the shank, and there's also a wear plate here on the coupler carrier iron. They rub against one another, and over a period of time, they'll both have a tendency to wear down. Okay? Um, but also, too, the coupler, whether it be in draft or in buff, the coupler will sometimes clang, bang, bang, bang on the shank between the bottom shank wear plate and the top of the coupler carrier iron wear plate. Okay? We're not allowed, as you'll see here in a, se in a second, I'm going to mention it, we only want to look at the walls very carefully because this is a tremendous uh, item that's, that's, that's subjected to a tremendous force. So, there's our FRA rules about it. The defects, loose or missing fasteners. There's a big bolt right there and there's one on the other side. They have to be tight. Okay? Uh, and again, this comes right off the front windshield. Cracks, broken welds, or missing coupler carrier iron wear plates. If I have cracks in the wells, that's a defect. If the, the wear plate is loose or missing, that's a defect. Now, they do have a new style of coupler carrier iron where it's a phenolic that actually does move. That in and of itself would not be a, uh, a defect. But if it's a metal wear plate and it's cracked or it's loose and it's metal to metal, that would be a defect. 
All right, moving right along. All right, aha, here we go. Let me go back two pictures for just a second. I'm gonna show you my, because to save myself, remember I mentioned this area right here? See how that's kind of rusty there? It's kind of rusty, it looks like it should be fitting further down. Let's go back two more slides now. There it is. All right, sometimes if this bale, and this is called the lifting bale, because it lifts the clevis, the half inch minimum clearance the FRA is talking about is the top of this bale to the bottom part of this loop right here. They look for a minimum of one half inch clearance. Okay? Like I mentioned earlier, the lower we actually have this bale in this clevis, the better off we are. That way, as this coupler goes up and down, there's no way we're going to wind up with unintentional uncoupling of that uh, locomotive because that knuckle, it'll catch that and then the knuckle opens up. Okay? So we're in good shape there. Great shape. <clears throat> Uh, the purpose of the clevis clearance is to allow up and down movement of the coupler caused by roadbed oscillations to prevent an undesired knuckle opening. The minimum federal limit is half inch clearance between the top of the lifting bale uh, clevis. The lower, the lower the coupler lifting bale, and which I mentioned, is in the clevis, the more movement can be made without the knuckle making an undesired knuckle opening. Believe me, that's not a good thing to have. So when I look at this, this is great, excellent shape. Now, the only thing you have to be aware of if this, if this bale is sitting at or near the bottom, which is a great thing, when this knuckle, as I mentioned this way, I can't even remember what video it was, but when you open up that knuckle fully and you pull on that handle on that cutting lever over here, remember what you said earlier, a long time ago, you gotta make sure that there's no way that, that cutting lever handle actually breaks a plane of that windsheet, okay? All right, so there's the FRA rules we wanna talk about. Once again, loose or missing fasteners, the one right there. And yeah, they, so I've even seen them bolts actually broken. Crazy. Clevis clearance less than a half inch. Right there. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Huh. We talked a lot about draft gears and draft gear pockets and couplers. Um, they deserve a whole lot of respect because they literally absorb all the train dynamics. Uh, and it, that, that they do deserve a real close look at, a real close inspection to make sure they're defect free. All right, main reservoirs, and again, we've looked at everything here below the running board because, remember I said earlier, anything below the running board can get you in a lot of trouble real quick. Wheels, couplers, draft gears, brake rigging, trucks, traction motors, all that stuff. Purpose of the main reservoir is to supply air to all components requiring the use of air. There are two main reservoirs on each locomotive. Mode, on each locomotive. Main reservoir number two is used for air brake equipment only. And the number one main reservoir supplies all other components that require air. These are the rules that deal with the uh, main reservoirs. Defects. Number one, loose or missing fasteners. Okay. There's bolts here that connect the main reservoir to the underside of the, uh, of the running board. Uh, so you want to make sure all the fasteners are tight. If not, that becomes a defect. Or a broken support bracket at each of the main reservoir. You want to look at these carefully because sometimes these, these bolts will actually slot out the hole, a perfectly round hole will actually slot out the hole and that hole now becomes oval and I've seen them so bad actually where the main reservoir tank is actually being held up by the piping not by the bracket so you want to look for that, okay? Any loose or missing faster is a big deal on that main reservoir tank. Uh, rusted through telltale hole, we've mentioned this on previous uh, videos every 12 inches there is a hole drilled, not all the way through but a hole, 3 16 hole drilled into the tank every 12 inches, both radially and longitudinally. So in the event either of these rust out, that will let you know that you have a defect and it has to be changed out. Okay, at number four, accumulations of oil and grease. Remember, the FRA doesn't like oil and grease on anything. Remember, if, if it's on the running board, it could be a slip trip hazard. If it's out here in the main reservoir tank, it could be a fire hazard. So if you see oil and grease on this anywhere, then you want to write that up as a defect. All right. Now, this is the FRA website. So I'd like you to go to that, compare what we're saying, what we're doing here. Uh, and again, that website address is www.fra.dot.gov. Now, also, I would like you to go to our website, and that is lst-ca.com. Once again, that's lst-ca.com. Thank you very much for, for visiting us today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, and have a safe day.